In terms of the panel, a very brief introduction. I'm going to not talk about the individuals because their bios are in the program. I want to say three things. They were selected because of their subject matter and knowledge as practitioners. And that's something that Will and I discussed back in July in London, That he, and he asked me whether I could get a comp competent practitioners to attend, and I said, I think so. Uh, secondly, in a way, while well, they've all lived in Toronto a good part of the time, they also, in a sense, because of their roots, represent the geographical diversity of our country, Hal being rooted in Toronto, Sandy from Celtic Montreal, not Frank, Fonorango Montreal, Celtic Montreal, and Jim from the Prairies. And third, all have a deep interest in history. Uh, in addition, and this is not a criticism, they are old, and therefore they have perspective. And it's kind of when you're old, you do have perspective. So that's if I could call upon Mr. Raird and the panel. Do you, do you want me to rearrange these chairs at all, or are they okay? Do you want to? Well, I want to uh, congratulate all of you tough people who have lasted to this hour. I think that's fantastic. Uh, it's been a long two days, and, and uh, but it's uh, been fascinating to the three of us, because this is not something that we normally do. Um, I've known Joe for uh, 50 years. He's from Saskatchewan, and uh, I used to have a, a, when I was at McGill University, I took a course in, in history of the Canadian railway system. And uh, I had a professor from Saskatchewan, and uh, that professor uh, was an elderly, elderly gentleman, and um, the class was one hour a week, and this was the regular routine. We'd all be sitting there, 30 or 40 of us, and five minutes would go by, no professor. Ten minutes would go by, no professor. Fifteen minutes would go by, and we'd start to hear Professor Culleton <clears throat> walking down the hall singing a song. So we knew he was coming. Then he would poke his head around the corner, and he would, with a big smile, say, good morning, class, and then he would stagger to the podium at the front, uh, thoroughly inebriated. Now, this happened every single time. The great thing was that he was absolutely fantastic. He was erudite. He was knowledgeable. Uh, he was inspiring. Now, I have been in Joe Martin's class a couple of times. I can promise you he doesn't arrive drunk. Uh, I can promise you, I, thank God, he isn't singing when he walks in. Uh, but I can also attest to the fact that he is inspiring and insightful and a, a fully engaging teacher. So Joe's an old friend of mine, and uh, it's good to be here. Um, the uh, I, I'm delighted to moderate this because you're going to be hearing basically from, from Jim and Hal with a few questions from me from time to time to prompt them. Um, we're going to uh, basically try and give you the uh, perspective on uh, the issue of, of, of the role of corporations from the point of view of, of practitioners. And uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, asked Jim if he would be good enough to make a few comments on the very first question that we have. And Jim, in your lifetime, what is the biggest change that you have seen in terms of the role of the corporation? That will get us going, and then I'm going to ask Hal if he would also respond to that same question. Well, you know... <clears throat> There are quite a few changes, but excuse me. <clears throat> the one that that really strikes me, uh, I don't know if it's the role of corporations, but in terms of, of of 
of the way corporations function in our society is the explosive growth in executive compensation, which might sound to some of you like a kind of a narrow topic, <clears throat> but it, 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 it's just unbelievable to me in my lifetime, which is, goes back a while, uh, the way it has changed. And, you know, I entered the workforce in 1964. And I saw, you know, when you talk about executive compensation and comparing it, you know, there are a lot of different numbers floating around. And so don't hold me to any of them. But they all kind of lead in the same direction. I mean, I saw somewhere that, 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 that the... Uh, that the average ratio, one way you look at it is, is the ratio of, you know, the CEO salary to the average worker's salary. And I saw somewhere that in the States, in 1965, which was the year after I started working, the ratio, the average ratio was 20 to 1. Today it's 300 to 1. I mean, that's an amazing change. Uh, let me just check. I, I got it just, just just to make a point. I mean, I think you all know this, but when you, when you see the uh, me, when you see the facts in uh, in Canada, it's almost the same. In the 1970s, the average ratio of the CEO to the average worker was approximately 30 to one. Today, it's some people say it's 195 to 1. Some people say it's 270 to 1. In 1970, in the 1970s, uh, a guy named Alan Lambert was the president of the Toronto Dominion Bank. And he was a leading executive in this country. He never made more than $250,000 a year. Now, in today's, you know, today's dollars, that's probably a little less than a million dollars a year. Ed Clark, who just resigned, or retired as the CEO of the Toronto Dominion Bank, was making a million dollars a month. I mean, those are, those are in comparative dollars. So, it, it's just an incredible... Uh, change in, 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 in the way that uh, corporate executives, senior, cor senior corporate, corporate executives are, uh, are compensated, which I think does raise some issues for the, for the corporations and for society at large. Now, I would say this, that uh, there is some indication that that trend is moderating. Not that it's being reversed, but that it's moderating. Um, uh, a study was done here recently by Hugeson Consulting, uh, and uh, what they found was that, that new CEOs, when they're being appointed, are getting less than their predecessors. Um, we have the whole say on pay movement, you know, around the, certainly around the industrialized world. So how significant is that? Well, you know, in the UK, I think it's quite significant because it's, it, as I understand it, it's binding to a degree, the vote on say and pay by the, by the shareholders. Uh, in Canada and the US, it's not binding. There's some indication that it has an influence if the pay package is voted down by the by the shareholders, the directors may think twice about what they do next year. They may. Uh, there have been a couple of examples. For example, uh, uh, John Thornton, who was the executive chairman of Barrick Resources, uh, voluntarily uh, gave up his bonus for last year. Um, but, 
you know, is it going to be uh, enough to, uh, to really deal with this, and does it matter? Now, you know, my life was in the, was in the private sector either as a corporate lawyer or as an executive. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a Marxist, that's for sure. But uh, I actually think it does matter uh, because, you know, the, the numbers are in a sense not that significant. I mean, what you pay the CEO, even if you pay him $12 million, for a large corporation, it's just a rounding error, really. But the but in terms of the signal that it sends to people in the company, and in terms of the signal it says to society at large, when you start, you know, when you start thinking about political and social legitimacy, I think it's really important. And you know, when we have an era of, of uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street, or you know, the whole issue of of income inequality in the Western world, the symbolism of paying, you know, your, C your CEO 300 times what your average worker gets, uh, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's very significant, and in my judgment, it's dangerous for capitalism. So, that's my initial observation. Al? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, if I can reach this glass. First of all, thank you. Um, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with uh, what Jim said. I should say we three are uh, the memory, memory of, uh, of uh, ages past. I uh, remember um, last night Justice, Mr. Justice Rothstein said that uh, the conference he went to previous to this one he noticed that everybody left except one person. Now, in this case, it's three person. We're the last three, and then you're going to get some dinner. But I agree with Jim, and I think I think uh, I don't know that the trend is abating. Uh, you mentioned that it is, and maybe there's some evidence in some places. But I think it is uh, very very serious. In fact, if you can look at it exponentially, when Maybe the average worker, I don't know what, what they're getting, an uh, increase of maybe 2% or something like that, and the average executive, chief executive is getting 12, 15, 20% this year, maybe, in, the, in this country. I think part of the problem is, is that the, the length of, uh, of office, of the length of term of uh, the average chief executive is down to four and a half years. They used to be there sometimes for 10, 20 years. But now it's only four and a half years, so they've only got four and a half years to make their bundle. And uh, they also feel that all these people are very highly motivated men, and sometimes women, but Carly Florino, she made a lot of money. And uh, uh, they want to make do something big during their term of office, like make an acquisition. And they, they make an act, and so they tend to pay up and pay too much and we've there are all kinds of horror stories uh, Valiant is the, perhaps the most recent one you may have read about that in the papers and all these are terrible things that uh, where the chief executive is wrong and then they uh, but and, and if those of you who are not from uh, Rotman should read uh, former Dean Martin's book on options because that's a terrific book. It shows you that the options that are granted to the executive, uh, they're not really uh, a bonus for increasing shareholder value. They're a bonus for causing volatility in the share price. And, so, and that's very different. And so, uh, uh, Chairman, I guess that's uh, all I want to say. But I think you, in this conference, you brought up a lot of um, purposes for uh, social responsibility that uh, corporations should embrace. But I can't tell you, you, four and a half years is not long enough. You've got, uh, they've got uh, companies have got to think in generational terms. The executives have got to think in generational terms, even though they may not be there for a generation. 
but they've got to lengthen their term and not try to get the quick buck as soon as possible. I'm going to uh, set Jim up uh, in a minute with the next question. Um, I'd like to do it by, by first of all, uh, talking for a few minutes just about a, 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 some research that was done by our former firm, Deloitte, uh, in the area of corporate governance, asking uh, in the United States uh, chief executive officers and boards of directors as to what were the key issues that they would have to deal with as corporations over the next two to three years. And I want you to sort of to reflect back and think about if somebody asked you the question, what is the role of a director in a corporation, uh, and what are the issues that they really have to pay attention to deal with, uh, there's a fairly standard pattern that, 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 that we might hear coming. But these are the issues that were identified. Number one, developing a resilient, innovative culture. Change is inevitable. Technology such as artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, and collaborative connected platforms will disrupt business models over the years to come. Number two, engaging stakeholder loyalty. In 2015, just under three quarters of large American companies said they experienced some form of stakeholder activism. They have positions on the environment, diversity, and more. They want their voices heard, often through the use of social, the power of social media, and they want the organization to reflect their values. Number three, this one, different. Cyberspace preparedness. In the first half of 2015, more than 245 million data records were stolen by cyber hackers every single day, one every 16 seconds. Acts of data breaches, cyber crime, sabotage, and espionage are increasing and will only get worse. Number four in terms of major issue, talent oversight. This is an era of greater workforce mobility, growing diversity, and severe skill shortages. Social media makes it easier for employees to learn of new opportunities. Understanding the desires and values of millennials is going to be critical to ensuring that you can attract and reasonably retain highly skilled staff. Number five, managing disruption in crisis. The pace of disruptive change continues to increase. Four out of five business leaders say their organizations will experience a crisis in the year 2016. Yet barely half of them say that they have any plan to deal with it. Many can deal with higher probability events, but they flounder when they are blindsided. And finally, dealing with growing regulation. Regulatory changes are now a fact of life for any major corporation. This creates both opportunities and challenges for boards, and it's increasing because regulations are increasingly global. That is not my point to comment on those, but those are the key issues that boards are facing and are going to have to spend a lot of their time dealing with. So my question to Jim is are these a reflection of the changing nature of, of corporations today? And if so, how do you see the board? Is it going to become more interventionist? Or is it simply going to continue to focus on the corporations? I'm glad I've retired. <laughs> That's a story. Uh, I mean, those are such big issues. I mean, I, I think that it's pretty clear that, and I don't know how would agree with me, but in the last 10 years or so, boards of directors have become uh, more involved uh, in, in running the companies than they were in the past. I mean, I can remember the day, you know, 
certain, particularly the big banks here in Canada, I mean, they have they have forty people on the board. I think I don't know whether whether Hal was on the board when, on the bank boards when they had forty. But anyway, there's, they have you know forty people on a board. You know, in, in, in my experience, you know, the upper limit of a, of a, of a, a good functioning board is twelve people. I mean. You get more than twelve people in a room, it, it, it's just a different, it, it's just a different thing to try to, to come to any kind of common, and you know, and, and a board should really be more like about ten people. But that's a bit of an issue if the boards have to get more involved, uh, because then there are fewer people to spread the work around. You know, you set up board committees, and in fact, that that leads into Maybe it's a digression, but I personally feel that the model is a little bit broken. Because, you know, it's very difficult to have a group of part-time people who tend to, who have to get together by consensus, you know, to make the big decisions to drive a company forward. And, and uh, I, I don't have an answer to that, so I guess boards will keep muddling through. And I, and I think, you know, historically, when boards get more involved is when there's a big problem. Uh, in other words, they, other times they tend to hang back and let the CEO do things. But uh, these strategic issues you're talking about are so big that... Uh, I guess they just have to be more involved, and 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 I think that's one of the reasons that that the uh, one of the valid reasons that the remuneration of board directors is increasing. They're having to spend more time and take more risk. And take more risk. and take more risk. Yes. Hal, any comments on? The changing role of uh, well, boards uh, historically, and I haven't been a, a director of a of a major public company for 12 years, I guess now, and um, things may have changed. But I, I generally speaking, I have, I have a low opinion of the contribution the average director makes. They tend to follow the lead whoever asked them to be a director, which, may, in the case of a broadly held company, is the uh, CEO or the president or chairman, or, a, or maybe a family-controlled company, it's a member of the family. But um, I think they, uh, they, they tend to follow the lead, and, and I agree with Jim. It's only in a very special circumstance, usually res, uh, involving the, the failure of the CEO, or maybe he's fired or should be fired, and that's, that, that poses a question when you have to replace a very senior executive. Um, then it becomes uh, uh, material. I, I, I am uh, personally very uh, much in favor of shareholder activism. I think that you mentioned that as a problem. I think it's a great thing. I think uh, shareholders should, uh, should be active. I believe in stay and pay, and I would go further than that. I would uh, uh, have... Uh, the shareholders' rights, whether they're in takeover, just on just having access to the proxy form. If somebody, if uh, the Prime Minister of Canada wants to run again in an election, he can run. He puts up his candidates. The opposition put up their candidates, but the Prime Minister doesn't get any special money from the uh, from the government to finance his campaign, or uh, or he, he can't change the rules to serve, suit himself. So I don't know. What a, uh, a public company should be any different. I think the uh, so I'm a great believer in the shareholder democracy, and I think Jim, who is a professional hired gun, and Sandy, you're a professional hired by professional hired guns. So you probably disagree. I'm, I tend to bring the perspective of a shareholder rather than a, a manager or an executive. 
Do I respond to that? <laughs> no, I, th- I, I think your points are well taken. Uh, I was dealing uh, and, and bringing that forward as a reality of, of what has to concern boards today. I think that not only do they have to pay more attention to their shareholders, they have to pay far more attention to their stakeholders. And, uh, and I think that it's a new experience for boards, and I think they're having a tremendous difficulty in dealing with it. Can I just add, can I just add one thing? When, when you mentioned stakeholders, it was interesting. For those of you who were here last night, and Justice Rothstein talked about the BCE case and how the law in Canada is a little bit different than the law in the States in that the board of directors have to do have to consider the interest not only of the shareholders but of other stakeholders and uh, and, and 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 I think he indicated I don't know whether 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 it's publicly or dinner afterwards but he indicated some concern about uh, which he was able to do because he didn't sit on the decision uh, but because he thought it would make it very difficult for the boards uh, and in a sense theoretically it does make it more difficult for the boards but uh, at the end of the day I don't think that's a bad thing uh, I think I think that, that that's a good thing that uh, that, that the boards have to they, they should have to consider the interests of their customers and their bondholders and and, and so on uh, and at the end of the day I don't I don't think it's that difficult for a board legally to balance those interests because at the end of the day the courts tend to to, to, to look at the business judgment rule and I would say to, to, to to Rothstein that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, if I, if I had to justify myself, I'd say, look, I'd show the court, you know, I, I considered the interests of the shareholders, and I considered the interests of the bondholders, and I considered the interests of the other stakeholders, and we thought about all those things, and we, we exercised our discretion in this fashion, we came to a decision, and I think the courts would, would respect that, and I, so... But it, but it is an interesting difference in terms of, 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 of the uh, public corporation, business corporation in Canada from, from that in the States. I, I think, Jim, he said right here at this platform that he, he, he really didn't agree with the decision in, in BCE. And I think uh, the problem with the... It's, it's, not, it's not that you shouldn't consider the, the unions and the environment and everything else and then in there's a in the in the judgment there's a long list of things you're supposed to consider but the problem is they're not prioritized and uh, it's really left up to the directors to decide and that's what I think is the pushback against the case and most people don't like the case it's least in my experience because they uh, uh, you know, because it, it it doesn't prioritize a, a, anything, and it doesn't really say. You know, they can say, well, um, it's one group of shareholders will say uh, we should p- paint our buses red. Somebody else say we should paint them green. Well, who's who? who, who how does the board decide that? Well, I don't know. You know. So. Well, you know, they do it the same way judges do. I mean, ask the judges how they make their decisions. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I've got one more question for, for uh, each of Jim and, and, and Hal, and, and that's looking into the future. Jim, uh, looking ahead, would, uh, would you care to make any predictions about the role of the corporation, how that might change over the course of the next five or ten years? Uh, well, I, I guess it's you know I, I think it's 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 I, I think it's only going to get more complicated and it and it and it's it's related to the issue that I discussed earlier. It's more than that, but but the uh, in this era of of, uh, of hyper income inequality, uh, 
it's, it's not just the large corporations that are involved. I mean, there are hedge funds and so on, but uh, they're kind of the poster children for, for, for modern capitalism. And I think they're going to be under a lot of scrutiny. And it was interesting that, you know, Roger Martin said in an article a couple of years ago, in, in talking about, about the executive compensation, you know, he said something to the effect that if this goes on, I mean, it can't go on indefinitely. From a political standpoint, at some point, there's going to be a political backlash. Well, he said that two years ago. And now you've got Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. I mean, that's part of what's going on. So I think it's, uh, I, I, you know, I think there's a big issue of whether or not, you know, the, the, the modern corporations are going to be able to, I hope they can, you know, rise to the occasion and, 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 and save themselves. Because if they don't, you're going to have government stepping in and doing it for them, I think. How? Well, I, I, if I had to predict, I think the, in spite of what uh, Trump and Bernie Saunders are saying, I think the world is getting smaller. I think uh, corporations will expand, they'll become international, national, and they will become effectively internationally regulated. I mean, you see that in the accounting profession, you see that in the, in the legal profession, you see it everywhere. The, the banking... Uh, uh, we'll have one standard of banking right across uh, the world, maybe. And maybe we'll have one uh, securities commission right across the world. These, these are, I think, trends that uh, should happen. I, uh, and uh, I, uh, I think so that the nation state may be getting smaller. I'm concerned, I think, about uh, our society, and I guess I would lump in the United States and maybe most of Europe as well. I think we're we're going to our expectations from the next generation are way too high. I mean, I, I don't think uh, um, we're going to be, we're not generating enough money to pay you know to, to repair our roads and bridges and uh, pay our pensions. I, I mean, I really think that our interest rate structure is way too low. Uh, we nobody can will invest in productive, make productive investment at three percent or something like that, and so if you if interest rates rise, that that means some kind of inflation, and it means uh, it means it's effectively a tax, perhaps on the next generation, but it, it means a a tax, it's a wealth tax, if the value of your, the currency goes down, and I think that's what may happen. It may happen. Uh, Worldwide, I'm not hugely optimistic, and I don't think uh, those of you who are, I, mean, I know all of you are historians, would concede that there have been many, many times in the, since the beginning of recorded history uh, for a whole generation, there's no, no real economic growth. It could happen again. So I, I think uh, there are real challenges for the, the big international corporation that, that I'm predicting. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, open it up uh, for questions, uh, particularly directed to, uh, to Jim and uh, to Hal. And uh, uh, so please. Koji uh, Yamamoto. Um historian uh, from University of Tokyo. Um, I, I've heard some sort of um, approval about um, shareholder democracy. Um, just by extension, um, I just wanted to ask how and how far might um, stakeholders uh, legitimately shape the role of corporations in society. Um, if we can talk about stakeholder, uh, shareholder democracy, is it feasible or is it desirable um, to speak also of stakeholder democracy of a particular kind? Or is this something of a complete nonsense? Well, I don't know whether that's addressed to me, but I think, uh, you know, we talked about Adam, the first session, 
I think we talked about Adam Smith and uh, his theory of uh, enlightened self-interest. And I think, and I and emphasize the word enlightened. And I don't, I think self-interest in, in a corporate sense is not necessarily a bad thing if it's, if it's enlightened because the competition that the uh, free enterprise system uh, is based on uh, is a regulatory effect. And there, of course, there's all kinds of government regulation. But I think uh, all of these other issues uh, which should be uh, concerned to shareholders as well as uh, a director who's not a shareholder. And I, th I don't know why they wouldn't be. I don't think there's going to be any choice. And I think what we're seeing increasingly is highly organized groups uh, out uh, in society uh, who are anti-corporations, uh, anti uh, a whole variety of things. They're well organized. They use social media. Uh, and uh, they can put tremendous pressure on corporations. I think that one of the challenges for corporations going forward uh, is to learn how to cope with those and to understand that if they don't, they're simply not going to survive. I don't know whether you were, were, were you were you raising the prospect that not only shareholders but other stakeholders could actually uh, somehow get involved in directing the corporation? I'm not you weren't sure going that far. No, well, I, I'm just coming from really a historian's perspective. Yeah. And may I just kind of clarify where I was going? Um, partly, it, what struck me when studying our important uh, relationship between business and society was that um, literature, uh, as well as various kinds of media, not necessarily actually hostile to to businesses, because these, you know, media and literature, like playwrights and all those, they are themselves selling their ideas. Right? So they are firmly wedded to capitalist enterprise. But these various societal players were, one way or another, in the short term as well as long term, having some kind of impact in the ways in which public understood business and also business community understood themselves. So that's the kind of uh, level in which I was thinking about the role of stakeholders in, in creating the environment in which business communities interact with society. So this is not various sort of you know, stakeholders some, somehow like finding themselves in, 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 in important. That's nothing. Uh, I, I, I never dreamt of that. Does it yeah, but I, I don't know if I could, I don't know how to respond to that, to be honest. Yeah, perhaps I can clarify, just to think where you're going with this. You've done a lot of I have a lot of with it. The, uh, there are some countries, continental Europe has a system of governance that tries to integrate stakeholders into the governance process. Okay. The model of Aufsichtsrat, supervisory board, Washington Management Board tries to do that, and it really in, brings in stakeholders. The workers, 50, large companies, 50% have to be workers. They can be also managers. They have other suppliers. They have bankers, insurance companies. Uh, it has a lot to say for it, but we did talk a little bit, I talked a little bit about the Volkswagen case, which it's a, a pretty bad example of a company going haywire. They had their access to it, unfortunately it's not. But I don't know if that's something towards you getting at the idea of integrating more stakeholders. Systematically, the <coughs> Europeans try and do that. It has some benefits. I'm wondering if you could give me your assessment on whether you think the stress levels of corporations have increased? Have the risk levels increased? I'm sure that during, say, the First World War, the Second World War, the Great Depression, 
the inflationary periods of the 70s it must have been as stressful as they are today for management, for corporate activity. You're not just talking about the banks. No, just across the board in a general sense. Or are we exaggerating the, um, the, the challenges that corporations are facing today relative to what they faced in the past? Or is this more stressful? Is, if you were to take the pulse or the heart rate of a corporation today, would it be pacing so fast relative to what it, what a, it would have done in, the, in previous crises, for example? Well, every generation is different, so a certain amount of stress, your doctor will tell you that is good. And uh, it's just the stress may change, and I'm sure that it's going to change, and we know it's going to change. And, uh, but a good executive should be able to handle that, Maybe good directors. But I, 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 do, I do think that there's no question that the pace of change, the pace of change and the uncertainty uh, is increasing really exponentially. And I, certainly as I talk to uh, members of boards of directors, and as I think back to the time that I, I was on them, uh, I would hesitate today uh, to become a director of a, of a public corporation because I really think the, the responsibilities and the pressures have increased dramatically and uh, the issues are coming at them in a much more unpredictable and, and quicker way than they have in the past. That's why they're appointing women out so they can take this from Fantastic. <laughs> Actually, no. Hold on. That, hold on. That's not a bad. That's not a bad point. Now, my wife never accused me of being a feminist, but uh, in, in my experience, uh, uh, having women on the board is helpful. From this very, you know, I mean, these are hard issues to discuss. I don't know what what you can say and what you can't say. And, what's politically correct and what's politically incorrect we'll and so on. But I'm going to give it a shot. In, in, in my experience, uh, women on a board uh, will tend to moderate the guy thing. When the, when, 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 when the guys get... Uh, when the testosterone right. gets going and... and, 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 uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, or people have to jump to a quick decision because of the pressure or something. It seems to me, it, just, it, it, it seems to me that, that having some women on the board somehow moderates that, moderates that uh, that culture a little bit. And, and 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 whether or not you can, whether or not you can extend the diversity in general, I don't know, but. I do think it helps. Since we're talking about women. <laughs> um, I, I was actually a board director for a company that had worker directors, and I used to actually help the workers or directors articulate what they wanted to say in front of the more frightening pinstripe suit main directors, so I did have a role to play. But I thought I'd ask a question about... Um, pensions and insurance companies, because what we've completely ignored is the role of the investors, and these days the investors are pension plans and hedge funds and all the rest of it, and they're the ones who dictate what, what happens in terms of executive pay, and if you look at something like CalPERS, for example, the lady who runs that, um, they've instituted a sort of sustainable environment, ecologically friendly, whatever future strategy, so they look at corporations checking that they are being corporate socially responsible before they invest in them. So surely that's the way forward. But in the UK, we have a problem that the Investment Management Association renamed itself the Investor Association and fired the guy who said there should be transparency of fees and more information passing from the fund manager to the, the investors. So we're now having the exact same overpay system happening in fund management because they're not controlled by anybody. But in fact, they should be controlling the corporation. Well, I agree with you. That That's an uh, issue here, too. All right, we'll go over here. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, Will Pedro, University of Kent. Um, you're all interested in history, and that's gratifying to me and lots of other people in this room. But I wondered, uh, having had all of your corporate experiences, what practical purpose you see for 
knowledge of the past in the boardroom. And if you could recover some attitudes you've witnessed about the relevance or irrelevance of the past in the boardroom. How are you? Are you first? <laughs> Well, the, the 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 way I look at it generally is it it's is it business history in terms of the practicalities of it. It's sort of like a series of case studies, really, and uh, and it's always dangerous, of course, to generalize from one situation to another. But but uh, that's what that's what can be helpful. Um, so it's of it, it's interest. It's of some help um, in terms of putting things in perspective and realizing that you know other people have faced difficult issues. And you're not the first guy that's done that. Um, it's not something that gets discussed in a in a in a, in a board meeting. And let, I mean, the occasional corporation. I mean, I worked. I worked at a corporation that had been around for 200 years, and a member of the controlling family was still the chairman. And so, you know, they they had a bit of a point of view about certain things, uh, and sometimes they might sort of say, "Yeah, well, we tried that 40 years ago and it didn't work," type of thing. So. Well, I guess, I guess it, uh, you know, in business decisions like almost uh, most decisions, you know, there's a reward and then there's a risk. And uh, history can uh, teach you a lot about uh, that relationship. And I mean, you don't want to be like uh, Napoleon did very well for a while, so, and, and uh, so did Julius Caesar. But in the end, they, they took uh, a step too far. Well, that's, that's the key thing in business. You know, you can do things. You can, you can lower your prices. You can expand your market. You can do all sorts of things. But you might tip the scales the other way and uh, you end up on your backside. So, I, The only comment I'd make is, is it, it's surprising to me that uh, if you speak to directors and executives today, they'll they'll explain a problem as if it's a brand new problem. Okay, but it's not. Um, what comes around goes around, and uh, so I do think that there is a place for history. And I think one of the tragedies is that business corporations don't, in large part, don't pay attention to their history, don't record it. And they're always thinking of the present and the future and their problems. And they never look back to try and understand uh, the lessons of history and how it can help them make more effective decisions today. I wonder if I could, uh, sorry, Neil Forbes, uh, Coventry University, uh, UK. I wonder if I could tempt you to, uh, to reflect on the, the question of personal ethics uh, and codes of behaviour. Um, picking up on your point about culture in the boardroom and the issue of gender and, and Jeanette's point about pensions, uh, we've just recently had the example in the UK of a high street store, British home store, collapsing. Uh, a company was sold a, fairly recently by Sir Philip Green for, for one pound uh, while he was taking out enormous amounts of dividends for his wife in tax exile in Monaco. Um, he appears not to have actually broken any laws at this stage, although the pensions regulator will be looking at this and what the trustees of the, of the, uh, the pension fund for the workers was, well, you know, whether they were asleep uh, at, at the time. But there has been a tremendous amount of moral opprobrium heaped on his head, uh, a question of, of, of moral, of morality of, of, of this. Uh, and I wonder whether 
whether you think, you know, it, it doesn't matter what kind of regulatory system you have, ultimately it will come down to the, the integrity of the individuals on the board. Al, you can go first in that one. Well, I don't know anything about the case uh, you mentioned in uh, Britain, but, you know, just the other day there was an article uh, in the Globe, I guess it was, about Sino Forest products. It was a, a company which has lost $6 billion in market value. It's, it's gone from uh, from gotten a huge price down to nothing. And the purport of, of the article was that we, somebody, the auditors are going to have to pay maybe a big fine and somebody else may pay a fine, but nobody's going to go to jail. After 2008 crash in Wall Street, nobody went to jail. That's what's wrong, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's a problem with our criminal law, because those are, uh, uh, you know, to put people in jail, you've got, it's not enough just to say you're wrong, you've got a specific uh, criminal code uh, provision. Well, of course, the, I mean, the easy answer is, I mean, you should be a person, uh, you know, and uh, <clears throat> beyond that, uh, I have to admit, when I was young, and people would talk about boards of directors, and, and they would talk about tone at the top, and I, th I thought that was a little soft and a little silly tone at the top. But I, I've, I've come to believe it's really important because it does cascade down. And organizations do have cultures. And it's, in fact, it's extraordinary to me. I've seen a lot of organizations in my day. And you can have an organization with lots of people in it who <coughs> themselves are quite good people. But as an organization, there's a culture. And maybe those good people are behaving in a different fashion it, when they're with that, you know, with the, that group of people. So I think the tone at the top is really important, which comes back to the issue of uh, excessive executive compensation and, and other things. The other thing is that, and, and, and a lot of the guys in the private sector don't really quite accept this, don't quite get this, but Anything that, that is done in a way is there's a social license to it uh, or not. And, and limited liability is kind of an incredible thing that is given to people. You can associate and do things and you're not personally liable unless it's incredibly egregious and unless somebody can find smoking guns, which goes to Hal's point. I mean, it's unbelievable that nobody, nobody went to jail from what happened in 2008. And that, the limited liability is given to this group of people by society, which enacts laws that allows them to have that. So, I think there is, that creates almost an extra obligation on the people that are the beneficiaries of that, to respect that, and 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 and, and, and certainly, if you're running an organization, I don't care whether it's a hundred people or forty thousand people, that's a significant part of society, and you've got an obligation, like anybody else that's a leader, to uh, run it in an ethical fashion. The other thing, of course, is in the long run, it's just enlightened self-interest anyway. So. <clears throat> I, the only point that I would say is, is up until about uh, 20 years ago, uh, the word culture didn't really exist in the corporate environment. It suddenly became popular. Uh, management consultants like Joe and I made small fortunes on going into corporations and helping them develop, <laughs> helping them develop their values. And uh, I noticed uh, Rockman School uh, has. Uh, uh, their value system up on the uh, up in the outside hall, uh, and 
And if you open uh, <coughs> annual reports today, at least in the last 10 years or so, you, you know, the first thing you see are the values of the corporation, which are right up in front. Um, but I think that if you ask the average director, and I'm not so sure if you didn't ask the average uh, executive of those corporations to list out those values, I think they'd have trouble doing it. And, uh, you know, boards uh, don't take it seriously, and, and I don't think that they use as part of the measure of their organization whether their executives, starting with their executives, are living those values. And uh, it's all very well to say we're going to operate in an ethical and honest way. <coughs> the question is how often do boards really challenge that, and, uh, and I don't think they do that well. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bonder. I'm a PhD student here at U of T. My question, I'm thinking of the last election. I remember seeing Kevin O'Leary on TV so often, and he was announcing that the Trudeau government would be so bad for Canadian business. So I'm using that as a jumping off point, and I'm curious, in both of your very long careers, have there been certain governments or policies that actually shook the business community and made you particularly nervous, or is this often exaggerated, the role that a new government will play in Canada's business community? Well, I, I don't want to, uh, I won't make any comment about the present Prime Minister, but uh, I think we could make a comment about his father. It was at, um, at certainly towards the end of his uh, career because of the national oil policy, and uh, he was not considered favorable to business. And uh, it was in his period we had wage and price controls, which uh, may have been necessary. I mean, people can still debate that, but uh, uh, Joe Martin uh, here will talk about, or has talked about uh, John A. Macdonald and the building of the CPR, which was certainly good for Canada and good for business. And it was, and it was certainly uh, only happened because of Macdonald's personal interest in it. But I don't know whether that fully answers your question, uh, but anyway. Um. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I guess it, 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 it's, it's specific. It depends upon the given new government. I mean, uh, if a socialist government came in, then big business would be nervous about that until they saw how socialistic it was. Or, you know, if you bring in a, a new tax, that's a, that's a concern. But, um, or if you, you know, if you're in the beer business and you, you care about, uh, you know, provincial rules on selling alcohol, you know, specific things like that. But, um, I, you know, I think Canadian businessmen tend to, uh, they just try to keep government at bay, at bay and go their own way, you know. They don't talk about government a lot, really, I don't think. But if you look at it, say, in American terms, because there is an election going on right there, I think the... The one word you can uh, uh, you can use when describing Hillary Clinton is predictability, and I think predictability is very important for business people. I mean, Trump is not predictable. <laughs> Cruz is scary. Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. A lot of people don't like her, and a lot of people have serious reservations. But she won't press the nuclear button without due cause, right cause. So she is predictable, and that's what I think business wants. Okay. This will be the last question, okay?
I'm getting back to the strategic issues, and also I fully agree with uh, Hale's comment that interest rate right now is too low to incentivize investment or increase in productivity. So the government policies after the financial crisis of easy money, quantitative easing, bail out, too big to fail, all those from my personal perspective I think is just breed complacency. I mean, corporations should be able to survive on their own. I mean, they shouldn't have bailed out money, even though there's economic repercussions. So going forward, I feel this world is changing back to, like, big government bailing out. And that is a disincentive, really, to corporations to grow and increase productivity and make things better for the common good. I'd like to have your perspective on that. Thanks. I'm not sure I got the question. Jim, did you like Well, you know, bailouts are, you know, a government assistance for business is always a tricky issue. Uh, you know, I think that on balance, the evidence is probably that the, the bailout of the automobile industry in the, universe, in the U.S. at the time that it happened was probably the right thing to do. Uh, because we don't know what would have happened if they hadn't, but it, there were a lot of indications that it might have been pretty catastrophic. Uh, and they more or less, I think the government more or less got its money back. There, obviously there's the issue of uh, moral hazard and, and the same thing with bailing out the banks and of course the problem with the bailing out the banks was the bailout went to the other banks. But uh, there are times when I think when government has to, to step in and, and prop up the, the, you know, prop up the situation and it's, uh, um, it, it's never an easy decision, and, uh, and there's always the question of why the general citizenry should be asked to do that. But I think if, if, the, if the government comes to the conclusion that it's in the best interest of the general citizenry, because you don't want the whole economy to collapse, then I think it's valid. Alan, you want to say anything? Well, we've got we have a real. This is a real issue right now in Canada with uh, Bombardier, who makes the uh, uh, aerospace things. And uh, I think uh, I don't think they should bail them out. And uh, the uh, the issue seems to be revolving around a fancy voting structure that uh, that one uh, two members of, of the controlling family who make, who make ten million dollars each a year. Uh, want to keep their jobs and they want to keep control of the company with over two billion in Quebec government money and a billion now they want a billion dollars from federal government money and most of these corporate bailouts are really bailing uh, uh, preventing the uh, bailing out the banks or the lenders uh, and the bombard owes a lot of money to banks Massey Ferguson owed, owed a lot of money to banks, so did the Atlantic fishing industry, and so did Dome Petroleum, and a whole host of bailouts. They, 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 they didn't need to do this, in my opinion. I think they should have uh, shuffled the, uh, the certificates of ownership, and the bondholders should have taken over the common equity, and the, and the banks sold their stuff off, or the banks took take the loss. So. I'm pleased to see we can close with uh, an ode to the banking system of Canada by the Honorable <laughs> Jackman. But on behalf of all of you, I think I can say uh, please give them a round of applause. For the great